P-P-P. The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. Let's go! What a time to be alive. We have some excitement going on this week with SDPN. First things first. Joseph Wool. Joseph Wool. No, we'll talk about oh. that. That's that's <laughs> hockey. That's not SDPN. Not yet. We haven't signed him yet. We will. Uh, we, sure we will. Um, uh, actually, uh, Wednesday, an exciting guest, Frank Corrado. Hey! Free, hashtag free Frank Corrado. Frank is going to come on, talk about his time with Vancouver, talk about his time with Toronto. Uh, there is a, a little competition. I'm going to put you and him in. We won't say what it, well, should we say? Should we say what it no. is? No. Okay, we won't. But Steve and Frank are going to go head to head on something. It's going to be a lot of fun. They're going to race. They're going to race each other. Frank's not going to come in the studio. <laughs> I like my chances. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Frank's going to tell us about playing hockey in Russia too, which is what he was. He's with uh, oh, Riga man. right now, and it's going to be. It's so funny. It started from like a, a Twitter conversation. Him and Carlo Koliakov were going back and forth. It was like, oh, Frank Frank Corrado's DMs are open. I'll shoot him a DM. And then he and I was like, hey man, uh, I'm from the Steve Dangle podcast, and we were big free free Frank Corrado people. And like, <laughs> do you want to come on? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> Did you say that? Yeah, I did. I, I, that's what I said. Is I that, like, Steve, is that embarrassing? I don't know. Is it? Yeah. Is the, introducing us as I your said, big free Frank Corrado hey, people? Hey, Frank, <laughs> wanted to introduce myself. I host the Steve Dangle podcast with Steve and Jesse, and we were big hashtag free Frank Corrado people back oh, in the day. No. If you'd ever be open, oh. we'd love to talk to you about Vancouver, Toronto, hey. and your time after. Oh, God. think people would be interested, wanted to throw it out there. What's embarrassing about that? We Hey, <laughs> hey, man. We were come team on our you. Show. We used that hashtag that very didn't work. And we would like well, to know the beer. I mean, look that at I'm, the guy who was up. It was up against. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think he even like at the time. Did he know the hashtag was going on on Twitter? Oh, he knew. Yeah, 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 he, yeah. Knew. Okay. yeah. he knew. Did now, he think it was cringe? Well, we'll find what, out. <laughs> what was he distracted by all the ice time? No, no he was, yeah, he was no. reading Twitter. We'll find out what Frank Corrado has to say about that. Also, uh, the hockey guy is on in a few minutes here, uh, about twenty minutes from right now. And why? Jesse, you have a oh. Why? Because of the Canucks. That's why. They're bad. Who sent Travis Hamannick to Abbotsford five minutes ago as of this recording. Um, so I, I'm i not sure how he's going to get there. It's going great. Yeah. Um, I'm not serious. I'm serious. I don't know how he's going to get there. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Like, I'm assuming they're not playing at home right now, right? Oh. I guess not. I didn't yeah. even think of that. Yeah. Oh. Like, I don't know how. Seriously. Uh, and then the other thing is, and we could talk, maybe the hockey guy can tell us, right? Because the floods have been insane mm-hmm. in BC. Um, Jesse, you have some exciting news from the SDPN uh, live stream channel on Twitch. What's going on? Yeah. Twitch.tv slash SDPN live for about a month and a half now. I've been doing NHL 22 franchise mode sim as the Buffalo Sabres. So I've been playing as the Buffalo Sabres as the GM. I don't play the games. No playing. No playing no the games. No interfering. And no interference. All I do is make trades, a call up and down players, and I don't even shuffle the lineups because that's the coach's job. You're an executive. It's been a roller coaster of a ride, but I finally, the whole goal of the entire stream is to win the Stanley Cup through the sim. So on uh, Friday's stream, it was the Eastern Conference Finals versus the Pittsburgh Penguins. The Pittsburgh Penguins, who are led by Nathan McKinnon in the game. Whoa, the, whoa, whoa. It is, it is the Cole Harbor connection. No, no, you're, you're skipping Crosby's ahead. Still playing? You're skipping ahead. What? Rounds one and two <laughs> both went to game seven, double OT. Yeah. Round one, we blew And a, you watched it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We uh, No, we do. We're not allowed. We don't watch games until the Stanley Cup Finals. So, oh, okay. Okay. That we do all event sims, so we see all the events that are happening in the game. And we do uh, five minutes at or two minutes at a time, and so the time ticks down. We watch all the goals happen, and then um, so round one, we're up three nothing. We blow a three zero lead. We go to game seven, double OT. We score. We, we advance to the second round. Second round, we're up two nothing in the series. We blow that. We're down three two. We win game six five nothing. We win game seven in double OT. Josh Bailey pots one. Round three, Pittsburgh Penguins led by Sidney Crosby on the second line. Nathan McKinnon, huh. first line center. Cole Harbor connection. We knock them off. They were the best team in the NHL. A uh, hundred and twenty-four points they had. Oh, yeah. My God. Crosby would at that point be in his like twentieth season too. He was thirty-seven, I think. Yeah, he Sidney started Crosby. at eight, wow. eighteen. That's yeah, insane. it's insane. We knocked them off. They were the best team in the NHL, and we were the eighth seed. It was one versus eight. We did it. Uh, our Buffalo Sabers, led by Timmy Stutz, Timmy Stutzla. 
I would trade for him. We got Sandine on there. He finally um, showed up. He finally showed up. He was up. having a bad playoff. Andre Burakovsky right now is the front runner for the Conn Smythe. Easily. He's over a point a game. He's like 19 points in uh, 17 games. He's been unbelievable for us. Lukanen is uh, our starting goalie, backed up by Shesterkin. Uh, where our goalie tandem's unbelievable. Really? Yeah, yeah. We just I didn't know rocking. who your backup was. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. We traded for him. Uh, Sandine has been out this yep. entire playoff run, but he comes back for the Stanley Cup Finals, which we made. So on Wednesday is the biggest stream of our Twitch life history. Our Buffalo Sabres rebuild. We're in year four, and we made the Stanley Cup Finals. So at 7 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, leading into the Leafs game, we're going to run from 7 until puck drops. So 7 till around like 9.45, so everybody gets a chance to get over there. We're going to sim and watch the games for the Stanley Cup Finals. It's the Buffalo Sabres versus the Chicago Blackhawks. Come join us. It's always a good time. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we win this and we accomplish the goal of the entire oh. Uh, uh, stream. Oh, I <laughs> cannot emphasize how bloody exciting these streams are. It's a good time. I listened to it on the way to the last show and I got up to game six and I'm like, Jesse, I need, I need to know what happens. And you're like, nope. You, you got to listen. So I listened to it. I listened to the stream. Wasn't even able to watch it on the way home. And when Josh Bailey scored, I was like, yeah, I'm like actually freaking out in my car. So that's amazing. It's captivating. Two last things. Um, there's going to be, I'm going to do some fun graphics for the Stanley Cup Finals on the stream. So you'll see a whole new uh, package there. And <laughs> if you, if you've oh, never watched, if you soundboard music, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. if you've never watched our screen, our streams, uh, all the Twitch chat chat, they're called the crab people. It's the inside joke from her from our discord i got my crap people sweater on right now and if the buffalo sabers our franchise mode rebuild all of the people in the chat they're my agms i'm the gm they're my agent they help me out with all the moves if the buffalo sabers win the stanley cup i'm gonna buy a buffalo sabers jersey and on the back i'm gonna put crap people and then i'm gonna hang yeah. it up in the Twitch stream so hopefully yeah. we get four more wins here and we get yes. that crap people buffalo sabers jersey love it love it there you go that's so great look at you that's a eight, good time eighth seed only four years from now that's where yeah. Buffalo could be. <laughs> yeah. How great. And uh, who did you hire as your coach and promptly fire? Oh. So uh, two, three streams ago, Jason Spezza was our big offseason acquisition in the uh, coaching department. We hired Jason Spezza as our head coach because the game does a really cool thing where retired players are now eligible to be coaches. It's a great, great idea. Great yeah. job, EA, on that part. But Jason Spezza was our head coach for half a season, and we had to fire him because our team stunk. So who did you hire? Uh, just this guy named, I forget his first name. His name's Cameron, something Cameron. And we've hired him off the uh, free agent wire with the coaches. And he's the one who's currently head coaching our team to the Stanley Cup Finals. That's why. So okay. it was a great decision to fire Jason Spezza. He sucks as a head coach. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> it would have been a great story. Yeah, that was the whole point. That's so heartbreaking. <laughs> and like you were so excited. You're like, oh, it was the best moment of the stream so far when we had hired him. And it was the lowest moment when we had to fire him. Damn. All right. Now, what do we think of the Great Wall of Joseph? I mean... Good for the Leafs for making his job easy and good for him for stopping all the pucks because if uh, there's anything that we've seen on the Leafs over the years and around the NHL is even if the shots are easy, you don't have to stop them. They can, just, they can just get by you. Funny thing that that happens, huh? So he stopped him, and like especially as the third period goes on because mm -hmm. the Leafs were winning that thing like, what, two minutes, 20 seconds into the game? And as a goalie, you've got to be thinking two things. One, great. And two, oh, shit. Because you got to be expecting those score effects to take over. But boy, they didn't. Um, Leafs did a really good job, but man, the Islanders can't score. Well, they have injuries and COVID protocol, I believe, mm -hmm. right now. And it's a bummer because their first two games back-to-back -back at UBS Arena are both losses. Yep. It just I think it was 5-1 and 3 nothing. That's really tough for uh, your first weekend. Barzal has eight points. Camp has six. It's a nightmare right They're now. in last place, and it's not good. Yeah, I had them winning the Metro. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they're last place. Well, and, and who could be faulted for that? Everybody kind of thought they'd be good, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, the shots by period were 6-7-7. Seven, seven. Now that... They were never in it. That was only their second home game of the season. Yeah. Yes. So do we give them a break on that? Um, I think we have to give them a break. It's tough when you got to start 13 games on the road. Like, that's not easy for any athlete. Yeah. They... Oh, boy. The routine people... You're going from city mm -hmm. to city. The NHL outright refuses, despite how cool it was last year, to do two or three games in one city, two or three games in the next. It would be so much better. But they're like, no, we won't. We're not. No. Don't understand why. Could be fun, especially if there's bad blood. It's like oh, Vancouver, Toronto, they hate each other. Nah, they won't. It's November. They won't see each other till April. Well, Great. And, and their schedule is not going to get much easier because even though it's been 13 games on the road, 
they're actually really far behind in terms of games played. So they're going to get to make up a lot of those home games, but it's going to be kind of condensed. It was back-to-back. Mm-hmm. And it's like the league threw them a bone by giving them another team who was on a second half of a back-to-back. But, man, that team... They've been the st- uh, the third round in each of the past two seasons, Game 7, against the Tampa Bay Lightning. That's true, what I just said. Also true, they've been shut out by Michael Hutchinson and Joseph Wool in back-to-back seasons <laughs> against the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I don't get it. I don't get how a team that good can't score. I do not get it. They are a very good team. Mm-hmm. They are a very good team. Good for Wool. Like, yeah, what a I, story. And and I think it was kind of cool. I was watching his press his post game, and he was talking about the fact that you know the guys were throwing down their bodies to get him the shutout, which I know meant a lot to him. You yep. can tell. Um, but at the same time, you know, he's got this. Uh, he seemed pretty calm and cool. Mm-hmm. And I liked, you know, I like his like little moments of zen where he closes his eyes and just, and then goes back to playing. Um, I'm I'm his sta- his style after watching Jack Campbell for so many games in a row is very, it's a little jarring because Jack is all over the place. And I find Will to be a little bit more, I don't, I'm going to call it stagnant, but he's a, he, he more, he doesn't dive around as much. Do you know what I mean? Uh, he's a lot more cookie cutter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm still not sure if he's NHL ready or not. Like from the games that we've seen him on, I'm like, I don't know if this guy can play in the NHL yet. I have no idea. It's two and oh. Yeah. But can he play in the NHL? Who knows? I don't really know. They played a great, That's a good question. Game. Yeah. He's, yeah. But he's exactly what I've been asking for, um, which is a third goalie who you don't have to risk losing to waivers every time you call him up or send him down. Yes. So hooray for that. I mean, because Mrazek, I believe, has returned to the ice. I don't know how close he is to playing. Um, I would like to see Mrazek play some freaking games coming up. But in the event one of Campbell or Mrazek get hurt, which is just going to happen, doesn't matter what their injury history is, um, you need a guy. Hmm. You need a guy who, I mean, I'm pretty confident Michael Hutchinson would get claimed uh, at this point in the season. Calgren just got to North America, and I believe he's injured as well. So they need to be able to depend on Joseph Wool a bit. Hmm. Early returns are adequate. They can re- they can depend on Joseph Wool yeah. a bit. Your third goalie like isn't going to be a Vesna candidate. It's like are you going to cost us the game? Is he has he jumped ahead of Michael Hutchinson in the goaltender's depth chart? Yes. Mm, yes with an asterisk. Like yes because of circumstance and it's this decent enough where it's kind of even and you get the bump because of waivers. Okay, Michael Hutchinson put himself in a position where it was worth taking a look at the mystery box. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yes. Now, um, what did what did you see from Mitch Marner yesterday specifically? Damn, tap dancing. Mm-hmm. I saw I saw Mitch Marner. Is what I saw. I saw the Mitch Marner we asked for, not just the Mitch Marner we expected. The Mitch Marner I, I expect is the guy who on the third goal picks off the pass in the neutral zone and advances the puck and gets the zone entry. That's all the Mitch Marner I expect. The Mitch Marner I don't expect, but I'm begging for, is the Mitch who attacks the net and shovels a dirty one in. Yep. Oh, be still my beating heart. Attacks the, the net. That's the key. Yeah. Who's the one who threw him the pass? Bunting. Bunting, yeah. yeah it was a great pass great by Bunting. Pass. Bunting looks really good up there. And um, I don't want to say that Nick Ritchie's role in this team is just, it's slowly threw, fading threw away. a big bad hit last but, night. <laughs> big hit and set up the Kasha goal. Yeah, yeah. He, looks, he looks good lower in the lineup. And uh, you know what? Good. Like, listen, <laughs> all I want is for him to contribute. Yes. And he hasn't, right? So he, oh, <laughs> Luke, I was so happy for him. And then Luke Fox tweets, that's Nick Ritchie's first, um, even strength point as a leaf. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, boy. holy shit, it's game 20. Yeah. Really? Um, uh, but whatever. Whatever. Mm-hmm. He he got it. He We know he hasn't been in the right spot. And now he is. I just want to have a quick... Um, just a moment of silence for Michael Bunting, whose season is about to go downhill very fast. Why? <laughs> he drew two penalties last night. And now he leads the league in penalties oh, drawn. No, you're not going to do this. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no. That's it. No. Over, under, over, under, 
for Michael Bunting penalties drawn by New Year's Day between now and New Year's Day is one point. The big problem is you're talking about it. If you hadn't have said anything, they nobody said it would on know. the broadcast. No. Cats out of the bag. It's he's the number, never getting the a call again. Zero. The, he will never draw a penalty ever again. He's fucked. Yeah. I can't wait for. Ah, he had suspended. a good run. He had a good run. <laughs> Steve, you good, owe. It's what? What? November twenty first. He had a great run. Steve, you owe the Leafs an apology. Why? Because what you told me something on Friday about this team that didn't come to fruition. It's true. Because it always seems to happen this way. You said the Leafs are going to lose this game because the Leafs always seem to lose this game. And Am I, I wrong? And you are correct about that. Her but- sister was a witch. <laughs> she All was right. the wicked witch of the West. You're going to look at me and you're going to tell me that I'm wrong? <laughs> I don't know why we would. Do I don't know. But- I don't know either. Um, they lose games on the second half of a back-to-back, Jesse. You 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 put out the narrative there. It's the it's it's the second night at UBS. The Islanders don't have a win yet. The Leafs are in town. Second night of a back-to-back. They lose to the Penguins. They're going down this game, and we always remember the moments when they fail, mm-hmm. and we never give them credit for the moments where it didn't happen, where they did the right thing and they got it done. So I that. think like this Leafs team, uh, they are on a torrent pace because they mm-hmm. I believe they just matched the uh they're three points behind where last teams was last teams last year's team last year's team was in the standings he, at they're this behind point last they're three points back <laughs> but they're Holy only shit. three points back despite the terrible start yeah you know, this team is a really good team uh the last 15 games of this season mm-hmm. and they've delivered in moments like this where they mm-hmm. should deliver mm-hmm. and I think we need to give some credit there because going into this you said it they're going to lose this game, and you were going to head on that LFR and yell at them. Oh, it yeah. Didn't happen. It didn't happen. I was ready. No, uh, like, really, their only boogeyman so far this season appears to be the Pittsburgh Penguins right. for, for some <laughs> reason. But uh, other than that, yeah, they've they've shown up in these moments. It's great. It's I They're blocking lots more shots. Like, that wasn't just a Joseph Wool thing. Um, they appear to be having fun playing hockey, which they weren't at the beginning of the season. Uh, they can play a tight defensive game. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, ugh, I can't help but be negative with them because I was... <laughs> there There shouldn't be anything no, negative, negative with this about. team. Let, let this me team explain. is rolling. Mark, let, let, me explain. Explain. Goals. let me explain. They're a great team let right now. Let me explain. <laughs> Here's my thoughts. I watch how they play against the Islanders, uh-huh. and they clamp them down. Yeah. And it makes me... what I know what they're capable of. I know they're a great team. The Leafs are a great team. But it makes it frustrating when they don't play that way. Okay, but... You know what I mean? But they are. But the Islanders can't score right now, too. Remember that. Ah, uh, that's negative. What? They can't. Uh, what? I mean, no. they can't. They can't score because of the Leafs. Right, Jesse? Tell them. <laughs> that's why. I don't know if Tell that's them. the point I was making. I, I, think, I think it was. <laughs> Tell them. Is that I want you to give saying? credit to a team you don't give credit to. Yeah, right? Adam, why won't you give them credit? <laughs> Hey, man, I'm giving them credit. People mm-hmm. say I'm too hard on them. What if the Islanders can't score because they're in the same conference as the Leafs? You ever think of that? <laughs> Jesse, tell them. <laughs> Jesse, tell them. <laughs> all right, all right. We got to bring the hockey guy on. And just so you know, I want to read this tweet out uh, uh, before we get into this. Apparently, and this is kind of scary, um, Elliot Friedman mentioned that, um, this is this is insane, that there are people aligning themselves in the Canucks front office right now with who they think is going to be around and who they think is not. So it's like an episode of Survivor. Literally, they're going, I'm going to, I'm this guy's person because I think this guy won't get fired. Literally, that's what's happening right now. I'm just imagining poor Jim Benning in a a room alone. One is the loneliest number. Mm, Poor Jim. Let's bring on the hockey guy. Balls! Are you taking care of them? You know what they say in basketball, take care of the ball. Football, they think they say that too. Jesse's laughing in the corner. But what is true for football is true for life. Take care of your balls with Manscaped. Lawnmower 4.0, it's got us buzzing, literally. And here's the thing, it's waterproof, it's 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 accident-proof, it's got uh, a, a little flashlight on it, because you know when you're in the shower and you're doing this, you gotta, you gotta know what you're looking at. Helps prevent the accidents. You know what I'm saying? And the thing is, what's so great about the package that you can get, and again, we've got a little special offer at the end of this ad, um, is you get the lawnmower, the weed whacker ear and nose trimmer, 
and of course two free gifts with the package and, and the thing is you know you might not think that you need the nose and ear trimmer well you may not need it yet but as a man in his 30s he's got a lot of hair i'll tell you it surprises you where you find it later on in life and this is where the deal part comes in that i promised you get 20 percent off and free shipping use the promo code dangle at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off free shipping manscaped.com use the promo code dangle do not not take care of your balls okay it's important that you get them clean it's important that you use the right tools for the job manscaped are those tools go to manscaped.com use that promo code dangle you know why sleep is important in your life in your world you need sleep and you know what's interesting is sleep does a whole bunch of things for you, like enhancing your mood and helping you organize your thoughts and helping things that seem very anxiety-inducing before you go to bed seem not so bad when you wake up in the morning. That's after a good sleep, though. And Helix wants to help you with that because here's the thing. You need a mattress that fits the way you sleep. Now, you take this quiz, and let me, let me pull this up here because I've got the notes in front of me. It takes like, I don't know, two minutes. I got mine. It's king size. Beautiful. And it gave me the opportunity to kind of show how I sleep and how my partner sleeps. And it asks you what side you sleep on. Do you sleep on your face? I actually am one of those people that sleep on my face. Uh, I got a lot of back problems because of it. Helix helped with that. And obviously with my overall sleep, it helps me organize myself and get myself together and make sure that my long days, which start at 4 a.m. and usually don't end until like 10 p.m., 11 p.m., Kind of helps me get through them and make sure I've got enough energy for them and have enough energy to match Steve Dangle. It's a lot more than you think. I'm not going to lie. So here's the deal. And it's an actual deal, by the way. Um, Helix is offering you 200 bucks off all mattresses, just on your order, two free pillows, and, and this is the best part, you just go to helixsleep.com slash STP. So get 200 bucks off your mattress, two free pillows, helixsleep.com slash STP. Make sure you take that quiz. It is so worth it. Get the sleep you deserve. Bringing on the hockey guy. Woo! Shannon, welcome back. Uh, Shannon, man, like this has been, uh, this has been a, uh, a let's season. start with BC. It's been a, it's been a season, but let's talk about, yeah. um, let's talk about BC for a minute. For anybody that doesn't know, um, the, the rain and I, I think what, what was there one, one day where there was 200 millimeters of rain in like three or four hours. Um, yeah, it was, it was bad. have you been affected by that? What, what have you seen? Just wanted to get a sense of how things are out there right now. Well, uh, the part of Abbotsford that I'm in, we, we didn't, well, I can't say we didn't, there's, there's lakes all over. There's like little like city lakes. Uh, the one that's not too far from our place did overflow. Uh, so our neighbors across the street, there were some that, that got flooded out. They've had restoration uh, vans coming in to fix them up. Our side, we were okay. So we were like really close. Uh, the main part that gets gets flooded is the prairie because Sumas Prairie used to be a lake that they drained in 1921. So they have pumps that keep the water out of it. But those pumps have been like unable to deal with the fact that the Nooksack overflowed in Washington and it just flows right into right into the valley because that's the natural way it wants to go. It's supposed to go. Wow. And yeah. and and so our I know there are certain areas I, I don't believe Vancouver is accessible, or at least it was not accessible by road at all. Uh for a bit there. Is that true? Am I wrong on that the, one? If if you're like from Abbotsford to Vancouver there's still there's still the ability to drive but if you're going from abbotsford and trying to go east it's kind of a kind of a hassle um even now there's a couple of roads that are open here and there but if like if i wanted to go to hope which normally would be an hour long drive it's it's a lot longer than that right now and there's there's roads that are just completely washed out like cocahalla is completely destroyed in portions so i it's going to take a long time for them to fix that wow wow well we we're glad you're okay and and uh, thankful for your continuing coverage as you burn your way through the NHL season that we've seen so far. It's crazy. It's been hectic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Just when are you going to start making more content? <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't make enough. <laughs> what are, are you, you laughing at? You must yeah. be tired at this point. Yeah. Oh, it like, okay, yesterday hockey started at uh, 2, two o'clock and it went till 10 o'clock. The day before that, it started at two o'clock. It went till like 10, but then I've got to do the power rankings on Saturday night. So 
from when hockey started until I was done making videos, it was probably about 12 hours. No. Oh. So, and then, and then you're too wired. You can't just go to sleep after all that. So my wife's asleep and I'm still wide awake. So that's, yeah, the weekends, the weekends can be, can be, can be brutal. Cause I, I make sure I watch as much of every game as I can. It started as a coping mechanism like 15 years ago because the Canucks were were bad. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to watch all this hockey and I'm going to feel better about things because there's going to be somebody more miserable than we are. <laughs> and sometimes there is and sometimes there's not. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, if that was your coping mechanism 15 years ago, you must be feeling real nostalgic yeah. uh, <laughs> these days because, it's, uh, wow. <laughs> It's bad. Like it's 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 bad too that during last night's game against Chicago, I was having PTSD flashbacks to back in the eighties. I would listen to the radio. I'd listen to Jim Robson and Tom Larshite. And whenever whenever the Canucks were not able to score, he would say, The Canucks are buzzing. They sure are buzzing. And I'd be like, Tom, stop with the buzzing. We want a goal. Yeah. And and last night when they were out shooting Chicago by more than two to one, I was like, they're buzzing. I could hear Larshite in my head. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's it's a cycle that keeps repeating itself. So Mark Andre Fleury, and again, it's the the, sad, the tough part is if you didn't catch the Canucks game last night, uh, it's they lost and got shut out by the Blackhawks, <laughs> who yep. have had everything swirling around them this year and a new brand, a brand new head coach. And, and, and it's funny, the headline in the athletic this morning was, listen, we know they have a head coach and we know they won, but they're still probably not very good. No. Uh, so if that's where Chicago's at, imagine where Vancouver is. And, you know, we were talking about it last episode, Shannon, and I think we really wanted to have you on to get your summation of what's happening here, because what we're, what we're hearing from Elliot Friedman on the rumor side of things is that people are starting to take their, their places in the organization with whatever group they think will be around after what we think is an inevitable culling. Like there, there probably will be some management changes at some point they think, and people are sort of going, well, I think this guy will survive. It's almost like an episode of succession. So I, I do, I, I do get a sense that that is probably happening. The part that I'm trying to figure out is this is year eight under Jim Benning. They didn't have anywhere near this amount of patience with Mike Gillis. The first time they missed the playoffs under Gillis, he was fired. And there were fans chanting who was firing. And I'm 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 you know, Gillis, I understood why he was gone then. But Benning, it just feels like there's this endless patience. And when he sat down at a press conference last week and said, I don't know why we're bad, it's like, holy crap, <laughs> what how do you not you put this team together? You told us that Oliver Ekman Larson was still a number one defenseman in the NHL. And I Ekman Larson's been good, but he's not a number one defenseman on a playoff team. So you can't just sit there and go, I don't know what the hell happened. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put up with that for eight years from your mechanic. So <laughs> why, yeah. like, like, <laughs> good point. Yeah, I don't know what's the, wrong with your car. <laughs> the endless patience seems to be the issue here because it's been only what two solid playoff runs and then just a whole bunch of missing the playoffs for the Canucks. And year after year, Benning keeps coming back and they keep giving him the freedom to make all these moves and to tinker. And they're not getting anywhere. And this is where they're at now. So why do you think that he keeps getting this chance? I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. I, I know they brought in the Sedins this year as sort of to, to learn the ropes, which I just think is, is odd. It's the whole thing is, is weird. Um, and, and really I think where, where Canuck fans started getting frustrated was when Trevor Linden stepped away from the team because he didn't, he wanted to do the rebuild. And the Canucks said, no, we want to stay mediocre and try to go for playoffs when they should have been doing the rebuild. So every year they spend to the cap, every year they're mediocre, minus 2020 when Markstrom and Demko were fantastic in those playoffs. But it almost feels like maybe that gave them this, this idea that, hey, we're close. And then they let Toffoli go, they let Stetcher go, they let Mar like all these guys go for nothing. And it, it's, it's not better. So I... I, I if if they're going to make a move, I hope they do it before the trade deadline. Because I think if 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 they have Benning do another trade deadline where he can trade draft picks for more for more guys in their mid twenties, I think the fan base will lose it. So every everything you just described about the Vancouver Canucks is exactly what the Leafs were out of the full season lockout in 0405. Yep. Uh, let's keep trying to compete, even though the writing is on the wall. Let's make decisions that are nonsensical from a managerial perspective, and that was a team 
that was notorious for ownership meddling. Is that what's happening here in Vancouver? Because from this outsider's perspective, it sure seems like the Aquilinis are pulling the strings here. Um, I, I, the own, ownership is is close to the team. I, I don't know how close they are to the players, um, but I, I know that there's... I, I get the feeling there's some dysfunction in there too. Like, I mean, last year when you have Bo Horvat basically coming out and going, I don't understand why they let all these guys go. You've got JT Miller had to come out and complain about the schedule when they came back from the COVID pause before they did anything about it. And it just, it, it doesn't, it kind of feels rudderless to the point where I, I don't even know if maybe the players don't know what's going on a lot of it. It just feels like everything is broken right now. And it, it, it's weird because you mentioned with the Leafs, the Leafs did that, the the Flames did it the last few years. Again, Lo was there. Mm-hmm. They just were, were going to stay in the hunt and they were always just below the playoff line or they were out in the first round. And that's, that can be really frustrating. Whereas a fan, you say, you know what, this isn't working. We need more draft picks. We need more young players. And then you've got Benning moving a first round pick to bring in Garland and, and Ekman Larson. Garland's been great, but Garland and Ex- Ekman Larson take up over $11 million in cap space. So, so you got the the whiteboard, and I love that you brought the whiteboard, the famous whiteboard behind you. Um, tell us what's actually f- wrong with the Canucks, and what I mean by that is when it comes down to breaking the team down, because no one does this better than you do. What's wrong here, in your estimation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Everything. I- like, okay, they're scoring 2.37 goals per game. That's not enough. They're allowing 3.21. That's too much. Is that too many? Their power, <laughs> their power plays is 16.2%. That's too low. Their penalty kill is 62.3%, which is shocking. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. Their shots, their shot differential is good. The weird thing is nobody's complaining about Demko, and rightfully so, because Demko's playing well. So I can't explain how they're out shooting teams and yet looking terrible unless they're not getting the really high quality chances. They get outscored in every single period except overtime, oh. where it's 1-1. One, one. Oh. Their, <laughs> their first period, they're outscored 19-9 to nine in the first. So they allow the first goal in almost every single game. So you can kind of, well, I'm going to head out. Like, it's just they're, they're 27th overall in the NHL. They're 28th in points percentage, though. So they're ahead of one team that actually has a better points percentage. And they're five points back of a playoff spot, and they've played two more games. So pick it. I, it's it's all a mess right now. So the the shot differential thing. I I look at I look at your board, and it seems like basically just score effects because they're they're losing at the beginning of almost every game. So yep. of course, uh, you know they're at least keeping up uh, in the shot category. So like I don't even know if they can hang their head on that. But here. Uh, there's always, um, you know, we complain about the Leafs not starting on time, not so much lately, but it's been a problem for a while, not starting on time. And some people put that up to coaching. Where are you at with Travis Green as the coach of the Vancouver Canucks? Because I understand arguments for firing him and against it. What I don't understand is how firing him fixes anything. I don't think it necessarily does because like the number one issue scoring wise is Pedersen. Pedersen, it does not look like Pedersen. He has three goals and seven assists in 19 games. Now, maybe there's a coach out there that can get more out of him, but I've seen like, oh, they maybe if they get rid of Travis Green, they can bring in Bruce Boudreau. I don't want to see another recycled coach end up coming into Vancouver. I, I, I don't, I don't think I like, it's weird, too, because all last year, all we heard about was how Travis Green was a lame duck coach and how terrible a Canucks organization was because they didn't extend their coaches. Now they extended all their coaches and now everybody wants the coach fired. So uh, it's I, I, I really think that what the Canucks have, their systemic problems. I think the special teams coach should probably be one that's under fire when your power play and your penalty kill both look terrible, especially when the team doesn't score enough five on five. Them allowing the first goal every game tells me Travis Green should be on the hot seat. Mm-hmm. But I, I I don't get the feeling that that's imminent un- unless we see a situation where both are gone at the same time. And and Aquilini steps in and says, this is it. And, in, and I've said in videos lately, for that to happen, the Canucks have to lose and it has to be spectacular. Because too many times I've gotten mad because they'll lose a game 
and you'll see whether it's green or one of the players going, well, we had chances. We played well tonight. Oh. And if we keep doing what we're doing, it'll turn around. It's not though. You guys are in really deep trouble. So the idea of, well, it'll just, it'll get better on its own. It's really frustrating to hear that. There are two players that I'd like to highlight um, that I want your specific thoughts on. One is an obvious underperformer right now, which it won't last forever. The other one is surrounded in a cloud of confusion. So let's start with Patterson. You know, okay. we all, and I could see it on the board behind you. He's got 10 points in 19 games. Uh, yep. Only three are goals. And that is troubling. In his game, and obviously he had some injuries last year. Yep. What have you seen that you've been like, There, something's obviously lacking? Is he still healing from this injury? Is it a lack of confidence? Is he out of sync? Is the whole team just bad and he's bad with them? And if so, you know, he's got to be the star that's able to pull them out of this. Um, do you believe, A, that he is, and, and B, what is wrong with his game? I, You know, it's weird because uh, Pedersen is a dynamic player when he's on. But it, it does feel like with the Canucks right now, I mean, it's understandable if their confidence has taken a hit. He's, it, it is really hard hard to pinpoint. Like, he's still getting opportunities, but it almost feels like maybe the league adapted. Like, you'll see young players come into the league and they, they light the league on fire, and then teams will learn how to defend against them. It kind of feels like maybe teams have figured out how to defend against Pedersen, and maybe he's struggling. Maybe his wrist isn't 100% from last season. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, that, that would definitely explain the goal scoring being down if that's not a hundred percent, but there, there really seems to be a confidence problem. And I think that in, in Vancouver, much like in Toronto, where it's a, you, when you're struggling, everybody knows. And so it, it, I could see how that would absolutely weigh on a player, especially in Vancouver, you're gonna have fans booing in certain games. They're going to hear fire bending chants. I, I really think that it's, it's affecting them psychologically as much as anything else. Canuck fans are tough. They are tough. No, absolutely. Like no yeah. one's harder on the Canucks than their own fans, honestly. And and but also no one gets behind them the way their fans do too. It's it's pretty intense. So so Shannon, the the second player that I'm so curious about and have been since training camp is Travis Hamannick, who to me has been an enigma since he was on the island. Uh, it just seems like wherever he is, yeah, there's always a trade him in, or he's at, he's requested a trade. There's always something. And then this year. We've heard rumors of vaccine stuff. I don't know about that, but I do know that he hasn't played very well and that he's down to Abbotsford as of about 25 minutes ago. Um, so what do you know about Travis Hamannick's game? I know they were relying on him to being a, a steadying force on that second pair. What's happened there? He's he's not Chris Tanev. Like he's, yeah. he's a good defenseman. He's I think he's probably best suited for the third pairing. Okay. I think the Canucks have asked for top four minutes from guys who are probably best suited being top six. Uh, I know they over relied on Jordy Ben when Jordy Ben was here too. It is it's frustrating because Quinn Hughes is all offense, and I always say like they need that Mark Mathot type that can be that perfect foil for him. And I don't know that Hamannick fits there. Um, I I thought Hamannick had some some good there. There's been some 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 good games here and there, uh, but it, it it is it is tough like i know he's supposed to be fully vaccinated soon which i know has played a role in whether or not he crosses the border because then if he came back he has to quarantine again but the problem that canuck fans have had with that is so with all of this out there why didn't jim benning know during the summer before he signed him to that contract extension mm -hmm. when you have that cap money and you're looking at spending it was there not the homework done on it or was he not telling everything or were the canucks not asking the right questions and so I think Hamnick is is more part and parcel of the fact that this defense hasn't been built very well. Uh, like Kyle Burroughs, right? I really like Kyle Burroughs' energy, but if you look at the numbers, it's it hasn't really worked with Kyle Burroughs either. Mm -hmm. So I just don't get the feeling that the defense is solid enough. I don't think they ever really got over losing Chris Tanev. Tanev was perfect with Hughes. So the, the Canucks are a couple bad things um one of them is bad by accident um it's okay to be bad on purpose it's not okay to be bad by accident but right. for the longest time i didn't know what they were like i don't know what the canucks are at their best i started to see them as like a a young fun style team which is basically we can score goals we're not that great at defense but at least we have a goalie what are the canucks at their best and how do they play that way? 
and and I I think that speaks a lot to again coming back to 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 the general manager. They're seen as a young team, but if you look at the average age of the Canucks, they're actually an older team. They're actually older than the Avalanche by a little bit. And this is a team that's kind of it, it. It's patchwork. Like there's some good young guys there, but there's there's definitely players that I I think are playing out of their depth. Uh, I thought that when when they traded you Levy before the season, they brought in Lamico. Like lamico has been okay, but to me, it felt almost like it was a panic move. Like they didn't like their 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 fourth line, and then McEwen's when Philadelphia now and Gadjevich is down in San Jose. So there isn't really any forward that can provide any pushback. Like I'm I'm not a big fan of you've got to have big enforcers and a bunch of fighters, but there should be some physical pushback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now the Canucks are all skill and there's no actual like I mean Toronto went through that. They got one when I got Wayne Simmons. The Canucks need that kind of a player and they they don't really have it. So they're a team that's really easy to play against. Hmm. And so the skill's still there, but they're really pretty easy to play against because they're not physically punishing. They allow the first goal almost every game. And their defense comes off as kind of soft. And the one thing that stood out to me, too, is they're they're kind of small. You look at some of the big teams. If you look at St. Louis when they won. I mean, every defenseman was a monster. The Canucks seem to be trending in the other direction. Like, they've they've got a lot of smaller players, which would be great. But you need that big physical guy. And, and they just don't have it. Yeah, it really kind of drives the, the point home. If you're looking right behind Shannon's right shoulder, you see the first period. 19 goals allowed in the first period in 19 first periods. Jeez. So you're averaging a goal against at least every first period. Now, you know, there might be teams with higher or lower numbers than that, but compare and contrast the fact that they're only scoring nine in the first 19 games in the first period. That'll kill you every time. It's them getting outscored by 10 for me. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you think, Shannon, about the um, the acquisitions they made? Because so one of the puzzling things, like Tucker Pullman was like, well, I guess right-handed shot defensemen are expensive this summer. Fine. And that's yeah. not. I don't even think he's right-handed. Oh, is it? oh yeah, okay. Defensemen are expensive this summer. They <laughs> yeah. were, they were, right? It's why the yeah. least uh, protected haul over um, um, Jared McCann. Um, the 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 thing for me that was really interesting was that they held on. They they traded for Garland and Ekman Larson, who, as you've said, have been good. Rather than wait out the last years of Erickson, Beagle, and Roussel and have an enormous amount of money to spend this coming off season, I guess it goes back to the management philosophy of, well, we gotta we, we gotta continue to fight for the playoffs. But from a from a fan perspective and from an analyst perspective, which is what you are, I'm questioning whether or not I'm questioning the wisdom of that. Like, do you really do you think that that was the smartest move to take on Oliver Ekman Larson for the next five years at eight and a half million dollars, or would you have waited it out and seen what you could spend this summer? I I was honestly coming into this last off season, I was excited. I was like, you know what, they've got these bad contracts, but they're all gone next summer, and and there's some good free agents available next summer, so maybe they can go out and they can spend if they spend it wisely, which has been the problem. But if they can spend <laughs> <Yeah>. it wisely. <laughs> Maybe, maybe they can make the right additions and we, you know, the top 10 draft pick and all that. Well, the top 10 draft pick went away. The the, the cap space for next summer went away. Ekman Larson's 30 years of age and, and over a $7 million cap hit. Again, it just feels like that's going to be a drain on the team. It was widely seen as like one of the worst contracts in the NHL. And Garland, again, I, I like Garland a lot. He might be their most uh, valuable player up front who's not Hoaglander. But if your best forwards are Garland and Hoaglander, you're probably not going to make the playoffs because you're you're not going to get the kind of production from them that you're going to get from a Tavares and a Matthews or from a Crosby and a Malkin. You're just not you're not going to get it. Have you have you even seen flashes out of OEL? Like, or is there is it very obvious that it's just not there anymore? He's he's steady. He's steady a lot uh, defensively, but the offensive side of his game has slipped. Like he has two goals and two assists right now, and that's about right. So that'd be, you know, on pace for about 16, 17 points this year. But again, for for over $7 million, it's just, I I would much rather that they had kept Edler for one more year at the three and a half million LA's paying him and, and then just wait until next summer. Edler... The offense is gone for Edler, but at three and a half million for one year, I liked him more than Ekman Larson for for a long time. Still at seven million plus. Ooh, he's on pace for sixteen or seventeen points. Yeah, yeah. 
Ooh. And it's seven more years of this. Ooh. All right. Well, is it seven? No, 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 no. no till twenty six, twenty seven. That's when the contract ends. I oh, believe. Oh, six? six? Don't worry six about years. it. Yeah. Oh, it's only it's only six more years. Oh, only and six? No, my God. Oh, Don't no. forget. <laughs> Don't forget the no movement clause. Oh yeah. Oh. He's here forever. By the way, I do want to say that the classic Canucks jersey that has come back looks spectacular on you. Those are uh, they're so great. Those jerseys. Yeah, they're 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 nice. They're nice jerseys. I I got uh, Cliff running on this one because he was my favorite player growing up. Hell yeah! But they, I remember the way the Canucks treated him on the way out the door too, and I didn't like that. So yeah, it, it's a tradition. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, okay. As a Canucks fan, what would make you happy? Yeah, I want to know this. Mm. Direction. I I would love if if Aquilini, Benning, whoever comes out and says, you know what, this isn't working, and and do what the Rangers did. We're you know sorry about this, but we we need to fix this. And it's going to involve moving some guys. I'd like to see some kind of unity between the team and and some something happen that shows us there's a direction. Because the idea of we're trying to make the playoffs. No, you are supposed to be building to a championship, not just trying to get into the playoffs that maybe you went around, probably not, and, and or you end up falling short. There hasn't been a direction. There hasn't been a clear... There's never been a rebuild. As much as the Canucks missed the class, they've never actually done a rebuild. They never, they never stockpiled draft picks. They never saved money under the cap. They've continued to sign bad contracts. And it's just, it's really frustrating. I, I would love a direction. The I point would. about them not having a rebuild is so true. Like, it's been since their Stanley Cup run, mm -hmm. they've never really bottomed out with this team and tried to build up something new. They've just kind of done it on the fly. And we've gotten to this point where it, that just doesn't work in sports. See, everybody got mad at Tortorella when he left and the, the speech he gave about, hey, 2011's over and you guys need to fix this. This doesn't work. He was right. Wow. He was absolutely right. So they made torts right. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Shannon. Well, uh, and, and, oh, sorry, and one more thing. Uh, uh, a lot of dissenting voices have left the Vancouver Canucks over uh, the last number of years. And I can't help but look at John Tortorella and the fact that he only lasted one season. And I'm like, I wonder, do you think... Do you think John Tortorella kicked up a stink? <laughs> do you think he was maybe a dissenting voice? Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, he... he uh, Right. What, well, what he did too was he was trying to play the Sedins in every situation, which they had never done. Right. And he, he overworked them. And then with Tortorella, <clears throat> I, I get the feeling he's the kind of guy that if you go to him and say, hey, coach, uh, can you cut back my time a little bit? I think he'd probably get angry with you and decide you don't have a work ethic. So I, I just don't think that whole thing worked at all. But that was that was the Gillis era before. So, right. That was what got Gillis canned was that he brought in Tortorella, which did not work for the Canucks at all. It was that's how choice. long it's been bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, listen, Shannon, you continue to be uh, uh, one of the like your your YouTube channel has been absolutely ballistic this year, as expected. Of course. Thank you for all the hard work and the uh, the you. videos and everything. We know like it, it's we're starting to hit that late November, early December haze, mm -hmm. and uh, Christmas break is it's it's there, but it's still far far off in the distance. So until then, we hope you hang in there. We know it's been a trying year, uh, but also uh, the reality action to you is amazing and so well deserved we love you and thanks so much for making time for us buddy no problem thank you so you know honestly great uh just great insight uh, he's he's fantastic but what a bleak picture he paints yeah but he's he i was so happy with how he answered the uh as a canucks fan what would you do or what what would make you happy and he just said he didn't say winning the Stanley Cup. He didn't say getting the first overall pick. He didn't say any of these specific things. Direction. The Canucks don't have a theme. Mm -hmm. They don't have a theme. What are you? What are you? Now, you wanted to... Fans can handle that on purpose. You wanted to talk about Shannon himself. Oh, just... I, I make fun of the fact that he makes so many more videos than me. But what, something that caught my attention that every young person hoping to do whatever in sports media is when he was like, oh man, there was there was this game on Saturday and this game and this game and it was from 2 to 10 and I had to do the power rankings. And I just, I was laughing internally because I'm like, it didn't even occur to him to delay the power rankings. It didn't even occur to him like, uh, 
Maybe Saturday's not the day because it's a really busy game day. Maybe I should do it on another day. Nope. He's just... I, there's a lot of discussion about like hustle culture and yeah. everything. And I understand the toxicity of some of it, but this is a guy, this is a passion project for him. This isn't bragging about working 80 hours a week for a company that doesn't give a shit about you. And ignoring your family. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ignore it. This is a dude who gets to work from home, gets to pursue his passion project and uh, kills it. Yeah. Just absolutely kills it. Yep. Yeah. Everyone should be looking at him. And 100%. a lot of the times hard work isn't working 80 hours or however long. It's just showing up and doing the work. It's consistency is what hard work really is. It's just, hey, I'm going to do this at this time. And you show up and you do it. And you do it over and over and over again. That I'm convinced. People always ask, like, what? Uh, why do you think the show succeeded? Well, uh, obviously, we had Steve, and that was a pretty good in. Uh, with a, uh, but I mean, at that time, would you have twenty thousand YouTube subscribers? Uh, it was a lot less, a lot less, right? Yeah. And and you know, you're at a hundred, almost one hundred eighty thousand now. So, oh, like, who's counting? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm counting because I'm <laughs> I'm, so I'm, I. I'm putting all the sales decks together for the SDPN and going out <laughs> to market. So I actually do know, and it's funny. You know, the, the only thing I think that we did differently was that we 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 did it twice a week. Mm. We never put it off. It was just we just did it. And those I know those days have changed throughout the years and they're a little more steady now. But they used to be like it was like these are our days. It was Monday and Thursday last year. You always make fun of me for skipping uh, Nylander's first game because I could have had tickets. I didn't want to delay. Didn't want to delay the podcast. I didn't want to delay. Um, OK, so let's talk about uh, UBS Arena. Because the arena is brand new and fans are obviously thrilled. I got messages all weekend from Islanders fans. We have an intense Islanders following. And they were like, huh, like, LOL, not not tailgating. For sure, not tailgating. And everybody's, you know, honking their horns and having a good time. So I'm assuming that it's just continued on as it did at the Coliseum. I know Islanders fans were pretty pumped to be there. Um, but the uh, UBS arena itself has got some new innovations. Ooh, Greg Wyshynski got in. Uh, they actually let Greg in an NHL building. Can you imagine? Stupid. And they let him be the guy to report on it. Dumb. I can't believe it. Good for him. Um, so what's it here? Shout out his blog. It's uh, Puck Daddy. <laughs> no, it's Yahoo. ESPN.com, which is no big deal. Nah. Um, now it's it's UBS Arena at Belmont Park, so that's a big deal, right? Because you've got uh, the baseball is right there as well, and there's a track. I think there's like a whole track there, and and that sort of thing as well. But that was the whole thing with the honking is the horse track, right? Now, um, obviously, um, there have been some really cool things. You, uh, Lou Lamorello actually helped design aspects of this thing. Now, I wanted to get into this. Quote, he was a driving force behind the Islanders' locker room uh, that resembles that of their practice facility. He helped guide efforts on the team, team arena's ice quality and airflow. He also suggested improvements to the arena in the uh, area designated for players, partners, and children. So he wanted oh. to make it nicer for their kids. Uh, there will be 10 bars, uh, including a 100-foot-long tailgate bar where fans can socialize. Oh, wow. Um, Offside Tavern, an Islander-centric bar in Manhattan that shuttered due to the COVID pandemic, is being resurrected as one of the bars at UBS. Oh, cool. Uh, which I think is kind of neat, right? Um, one of the things, though, that I think you'll find very, very interesting, and I absolutely love this because it just reminds me of Lou Lamorello in Toronto. So let me read you this. There's a, in the locker room, there's an actual trap door and dungeon. No, for if you <laughs> no, no. So um, uh, <laughs> player themed drinks, which were a thing at the previous arena are no longer. So there was the instantly memorable Josh Ho Tang. They used to have that. No. Yeah. That's uh, not a thing anymore? At the new Offside uh. Tavern, he has, uh, uh, they basically, Lou Lamorell has said, absolutely not. There will be no player-centric drinks. It's only team team beverages. Like, like Lou Lamorello, I get it. with all that he has to do, is looking at the menu names of all the items at UBS Arena and saying, nope, nope, nope. Make it about the team. Make it about the team. Make it about the team. Well, the Leafs, kept doing that like player name based things and they kept having to change it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because people got traded and or fired there's Berkey's doghouse 
the and they had to change the whole thing because they fired him. One of the worst ones was Loop's troops. Oh, uh, when it, Joffrey Loop will just went away and they had to just, no, no, and, it's, and but, then it was you Leap's know what's troops. No, it was, <laughs> but it was originally Luke's troops. Yeah, Luke, Luke Shen. Luke Shen. It was yeah. Luke Shen. Oh. Then it was Loop's troops. Then it was Loop. And then they real okay. We're we've run out of L players, so yeah. they just made it Leaf's troops. They but remember when Cody Franzen came out and did Loop's troops. No, we were at the game. Man, I was at I was there where Christian Hansen came out and was like one of the Leafs alumni. I'm like, oh, do you remember? I do, I do remember this. And also, yeah, Christian Hansen, like, dude, they bring out Wendell Clark yeah. and like Kiprios is at and, very least like a like yeah. a TV personality <laughs> still. But they're all right, veteran of twenty five games with your <laughs> Toronto Maple Leafs, Christian Hansen, <laughs> and everyone's just like, oh, oh, that's cool. That shouldn't be the reaction from the crowd. Um. They also have a nice little touch. This is for the fans because the fans, the Islanders are, are different in the fact that their fan groups have names like like a like a European team, like a European soccer team would have. And so they've got the insignia of all the fan groups in one part of the arena, like in front of everybody, which I think is kind of cool. And there's got there's over there's got to be like 20 of them, which is amazing. Um, and uh, obviously uh, they've got the Islander sandwich, which um, Sean McKenzie took a big bite of and it's orange and blue it looks good it does look good well it's fried chicken come on yeah. can it not be that's yeah, true um the restrooms according to um uh, uh Wyshynski, um <laughs> ubs arena will have 68 guest facing restrooms throughout the arena 12 of which will accommodate families ubs arena will also have quote the largest number of women's restrooms in the nhl according to the team which is no doubt fantastic news for anybody who's ever gotten in line for one of those in the intermission and that's true like honestly there's an argument to be made that there should almost be double one versus the other because the just the difference in how you go, right? Like it's it, the, where do you where, when you're at an arena, where's the lineup always snaking out of? It's always out of the women's room. That's at a hockey game. Yeah, the worst one of the worst fan experiences I ever had was actually um, this was a long time ago. It was uh, Jake Shields versus George St. Pierre UFC. You couldn't. You had to. <laughs> In the time you you could go to the bathroom and then you might as well get back in the line for the next time you got to pee. Oh, oh it was brutal. I it remember brutal. being at a Backstreet Boys and New Kids on the Block uh, concert in Calgary because they went on tour together and we had you know Virgin Radio had tickets and we and we gave you brought fans to it and I went out to the to the concourse to go to the bathroom and they hadn't even turned the men's room lights on. Really? <laughs> like I peed in the dark. Actually, there was a there was a concert my wife and I went to. I think it was Justin Timberlake, and the lineup for the women's room was so long. I went in the men's room, and she's like, "Just spot me." I'm yeah, just <laughs> she came, yeah. Why not? She came in because it was empty. It was just us two. <laughs> so here's the other thing the Islanders did. I think you'll find this cool. You should read Wish's article, but um, they had employees participate in a coordinated flush around the building to ensure the pipes could handle the water flow. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like three two one everybody flush and That's every t- they flushed every toilet in the whole building to make sure that is kind of fun yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be kind of be, be a part of a coordinated flush i think that would be a good time how much was the wine they were making a big deal that sean mckenzie was drinking the wine it was like 19 dollars 25 25 dollars for like a little thing of wine he's drinking with a straw oh I didn't that's see really that. expensive commemorative uh metal cups i saw David yeah Alter, that's uh, probably why it was 25 dollars because you get the cup with it i assume so right like when you I go to Rogers so. Center and you get the popcorn bowl with the Jays thing on it's plastic, it costs like 12, 15 bucks or whatever, and the regular bag is like 10. But you're like, yeah, at least I get this. Yeah. And <laughs> I think lost in all this, too, guys, and this is really important. Who did this arena? What do you mean? Uh, Construction private workers. company. Who did not this arena? Not the government. Farmers. Not farmers. They don't get enough dun, 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 dun. Yep. No. I don't know. Uh, the Oakview Group. That would be. The Laiwiki brothers, they also did Seattle. They did these arenas together at the same time on opposite sides of the continent. Hmm. So I, I find that fascinating because they seem to be the group. I, I would I would keep my eyes on those guys because this is a company now that has an extremely successful launch in Seattle to its name. Mm-hmm. And they now have UBS Arena, which from all uh, from all reports is actually really a great fan experience. There are a lot of teams that need arenas in the next 10 years. And if you've got a company, like think about it, you're a billionaire, 
you're going to go with the company with the, the recent track record of success, right? Of course. Like, look at Scotiabank Arena. People don't realize this. Within, like, it's already 20 something, it's already 20 years, 21, 22 years old? 1999, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, so 22 years old. Yeah. What's the average lifespan of an arena? 30 years? Roughly. 90 if you're Roger Center. <laughs> and like Wiki obviously is connected to MLSE because he was the, the president and CEO at one point. But I think what I'm saying is I would look for that group to do a lot more building hmm. because they seem to be the ones who could get it done. How long did the Islanders sit and twist in the wind and try to get an arena done? I'm and then, and then all so of a sudden, they, they never got it done. And then Seattle took how many swings at the NHL? A lot. Swing and a miss, swing and a miss, swing and a miss. And then all of a sudden... The, the Oakview groups in and they get it done. And you look at what happened to the, like what the Laiwikis, and people forget what happened in Los Angeles before the Laiwikis got there. And what happened in Toronto before the Laiwikis got there. These guys, I would be, I would have both eyes on these guys. Hmm. I don't know what their next project is, but I'd be very fascinated to see. Cause I think it'd be, whatever it is, it's going to have something to do with the NHL and there's going to be another arena built. It's somewhere. very, you, you got a nose for business. Well, there's something about. there. Do you not think? No, no, they just 100%. Built two arenas and in places that couldn't get an arena done. Totally. And I'm so genuinely happy for New York Islanders fans. Oh, who yeah. Absolutely deserve it. Um, you know where your home is now. So welcome home. Um, I, have, I have trivia for you guys oh. quickly. Uh, Madison Square Garden is the oldest arena in the NHL. Oh. The second oldest arena in the NHL was Nassau Coliseum. Mm. What is the third oldest arena? Now the second oldest arena because Nassau is off the list. Oh, is it the Bell Center? Oh, That's Adam's guess. Steve, what's your guess? No. Second oldest? So Madison Square Garden is the oldest. Saddle them. What comes, what comes oh. next? Oh. Has to be saddle them. Damn it. Can that be my guess? Yeah. <laughs> That is the correct answer. Hey, well done. Hey. Hey. Got them. Bell's got to be up there, and the Bell Center's got to be up there. It's not, uh, because like Bell Center's fa fairly recent, 96. Uh, it's <laughs> Madison, MSG, uh, Saddle Dome, Honda Center, 93 for the Ducks, SAP Center, 93 for the Sharks, and then United Center, 94 with the Blackhawks, Enterprise Center, 94 with well, the Blues. I've never been in the United Center, but I would imagine that with, you know, uh, Wirtz senior in charge that there were some corners cut in terms of <laughs> fan experience on that one. So I would have loved, I, he was notoriously cheap. Yeah, it wasn't so, made for no. TV. They didn't broadcast games. <laughs> like. Nope. Don't even put the cable cameras in. We don't care. No, 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 no. Nobody gets electrical outlet. I, I wonder I wonder how many how much retrofitting they had to do to get local games on TV there. Oh yeah. Well, and it's funny because as you go down that list, it's some of the most unique uh, TV viewing experiences. Like this, no arena in the NHL is lit the way the Ducks is, mm -hmm. or the way the Sharks is. Um, also, and the Calgary Flames have this weird like video game angle. Yeah, they do. So do the Panthers. Didn't they? Did they at least uh, play the Panthers last week? Is that what it was? Yeah. You know what? You're right. It yeah. feels further back. I don't know what it is about the Panthers angle, but it's different. I don't think the Leafs played the Panthers, but you are. Yeah. Am you're I right? You're right. There was something. I was watching the Panthers. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> I can't. I, I watch so much hockey. I can't even remember what I watched. But it's just, yeah, I feel that. It's just. I feel that. at this point, honestly, I, I, I think what it is too, and I'll be honest. I'm not sure how. If you're like, if you're a fan, I'm not sure how you're feeling about this. But only getting like a month and a half off between seasons, I'm definitely further on my burn curve than I normally would be. <laughs> I. I feel that way. I think I'll be okay. I'll be fine. We're, we get to play in the candy store. This is what we do for a living? Come on. Yeah, no. This is I, great. But I'm just saying, you, you do burn a little bit. It's not that I'm losing interest. It's just some days you wake up and you're like, I don't even know what day it is anymore. I'm still adjusting to the just the new schedule of doing videos night of. Because even though I'm not editing them, I am shooting them. Mm -hmm. It's not like I go to bed right away afterwards. You don't go from ah to, <sighs> you know. Yeah. So it's I'm, I'm getting used to it. It's okay. But the... It's all about the hashtag content. Let's baby. do the press conference. The Presser SDP. The Steve Dangle Press Conference. If, if you don't mind, can we actually put a little addition onto our uh, Riley Tuft conversation that we sure. had last show? So, um... Yeah, no, the stars uh, didn't do a good job at that. Okay, yeah, so the more that, <laughs> the more that we found out, the, the Rick Bonus press conference after that came out after we recorded 
Did so, not look good. So, so can you update. Uh, well, I didn't realize that the poor kid did like a game day skate or um, game day press conference, I guess, at their morning skate. And was like, oh, yeah, to play in front of my parents. It's going to be really exciting. Can't wait. And so they must not have communicated with him. No, uh -huh. no, they didn't. Oh. And it's it's incredibly difficult to get behind that decision. It's incredibly difficult, and I, I like I did speak to some people who are like, dude, it's it's the 14 forward. It wasn't ever going to prevent them from losing seven two. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, if if it wouldn't have changed the outcome, then play him. Yeah, and that's that's essentially what we said during the show, and then everything that came out after was just like reinforcing your point. Here's another nail. Bad, yeah. bad. It's yeah. worse. Well, worse. The, <laughs> reason, the reason I felt the need to bring it up is I was like, well, what if no one's wrong? Like, what if this? No, was... we were more right by the end of it. Yeah, no. The more details came out, I'm like, mm, no, think... it's kind of shitty that you did that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that things aren't good there. No. Oh yeah. No. 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 I. That's that's my early season bet. He's first to go. Oh, my early wow. season bet. Rick mm -hmm. bonus first to go. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, look out for the Your Team Season is Over awards coming December 1st. The Dallas Stars will be on the block for uh, nomination. I wanted to ask you about that because yeah. it's December 1st. It's like 80% of the teams who are out of it end up being out of it or mm -hmm. something like that. It's different this year, though. Should it, be, should it be December 15th because this season started later? It started later by like what two weeks? A week and a half. A week and a half. Yeah. So then you think we should push it a week and a half? I'm just saying. I'm just saying this year's numbers might be wonky. I'm gonna say that no, because it's usually the the stat is Thanksgiving. So American I already, Thanksgiving. American Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. So I already gave it a week because I'm doing because oh. American Thanksgiving is this Thursday. Then perfect. And then we're doing the awards December first. Mm -hmm. So I already gave it a little bit. Mm. So giving it a little bit more, I feel like is a little is. A little too late in the season. And you'll have so much content on SDPN that you won't have to be part of any uncomfortable conversations. And don't worry, we're going to be doing <laughs> World Junior previews and Olympic previews. There's lots to do. Yeah. The second your uncle goes, what do you think about, before you get to the end of the sentence, you turn on the Chris Johnson show, Agent Provocateur, game over, whatever you want. Let me explain Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crypto, Grandpa. Adam Wild, this question comes from The Mothman. Okay. on our discord channel all right, all right. if you're not a bring, part of our discord it. go to sdpn.ca hit the link that says join our discord does adam know which supreme court justice played for the pittsburgh steelers oh i don't i don't that's cool though do you no but that <laughs> seems like the sort of thing you would know just yeah, because I you're a steelers that. guy Let's yeah. find out. No, no, no. I, that's uh, that's the question. I don't know that. That's cool. Ruth I, Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you don't have a guess. Antonin no. Scalia. No. So uh, Byron White. Oh, that's cool. The name. He played for them when they were called the Pirates because the football team was formerly the Pittsburgh Pirates. That's right. They were the yeah. both teams were the Pirates because yeah. it, it. They said it made it less confusing. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like the CFL. And they, <laughs> have you seen that? <laughs> have you seen the jerseys too? Those like the old school Steelers jerseys. I have not. They look like a bumblebee. They have a. They literally yeah. and they put them on and, and they're trying to sell them. And no one's. Everyone's like, we won't buy these. These are the ugliest jerseys we've ever seen. Yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black, all the way down, like it's an American flag. It's just wild. They're the ugliest jerseys in the history of ugly jerseys, except for Dallas's, which are the ugliest jersey. It's. Oh, you mean the the regular one? What's that? No, no, I'm talking about Dallas Dallas uh, Stars, the Dallas Stars jersey. No, I so know. Lovely. I was, but their neon Steve. one is somehow worse. Oh yeah. See it? Oh dear. Are they terrible? That's a rugby. J no. I know. <laughs> We're the Pirates. Play next to the Pirates <laughs> at Three River Stadium. It's the Pirates taking on the Pirates. The <laughs> Ottawa Rough Riders are taking, taking on the Saskatchewan Rough, Rough Riders. Riders. The it, it, see the Saskatchewan Rough Riders is one word. The Ottawa is Rough Riders. Get it right. All I can see is the I know. <laughs> is pretty it's like the little girl running around in that yeah. video. Yeah. They look like a failed Winnie the Pooh character. Uh, Adam, you had another question oh, as well uh -oh. from Discord. I don't know why these came up two in a row, but that's how I'm going to read them. This is from Aziz for Adam Wild. Would the NHL benefit from replacing Gary Bettman with somebody yes. like Chase Carey, ex-CEO of F1? If you think about it, the NHL under Bet Bettman is so similar to how F1 was under Ecclestone. Is that what I'm Bernie Ecclestone, yes. Old, out of touch, head of the sport, grew the sport in non-traditional markets early on, but then stagnated. Yeah. Not popular fans, held the sport back from, on from modernizing, and so much more. 
What do you think, Adam? I don't know any of these names so, that this person's referencing, so I'll explain it. So what's been really interesting is Bernie Ecclestone uh, uh, did buy and revolutionize the sport. But as as we know with executives, after about five years, your ideas can get a bit stale and it's time for you to move on. Bernie owned the, I believe he owned it. So he stayed there for like 50 years. He and owned F1. I'm pretty sure he was an this owner. This guy. His name Bernie is Bernie Eccles- Ecclestone and he's real? <laughs> yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah. And here's a, he's like five foot two. This wasn't a Christmas um, movie? And uh, They took all the presents. <laughs> it's like a bad adaptation of Scrooge. <laughs> Yeah. No, his name will be Bernie Ecclestone. If he didn't, I know he owned teams. He may have owned owned F one as well. But once the once they got here's here's what you don't want. Like so, controversies, Labor Party controversy, <laughs> Hitler controversy, bribery what? accusation, <laughs> racial statement, let's, tax avoidance. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what's coming across. <laughs> let's uh, reverse a little bit. <laughs> I think. So did this happen when Hitler was or like World no, War Two? No, 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 because because uh, Bernie Bernie was born in 1930, so he would have oh, okay. remembered <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, like you, the, Bernie Ecclestone has a checkered past to put it. Lightly, the new Adam um, Wild game is <laughs> yeah. how many degrees away from World War II is yeah, the conversation. Really. It's true. Well, but I'm just saying I'm going through his controversies and it's it's bad. And so Bernie Ecclestone <laughs> was a regressive. You know, at the when he bought the sport or bought into the sport and became an executive, he was a maverick. But what happens is life passes you by. It's going to happen to every one of us. And yeah, Chase Carey. Look at what look at what's happened. Four hundred and fifty thousand people showed up to a Formula One race in nascar country in texas nascar is is dying on the vine Mm -hmm. there are still markets where it's viable but nascar used to be king in north america Mm -hmm. and then even the pan am and the can am series and stuff like that the the um nascar was it when richard petty was the guy and dale earnhardt senior was the guy when they were when they were the people that was the sport my dad watched it all the time formula one was ah, it's that european flimsy car thing we like to go in circles and with big stock cars yeah and and it played to the heritage of what north america was you know which is these these cars were guys that had you know gearhead and you know made them faster when you know in the 1950s and stuff like that and they'd been racing each other you know that's the that's the whole thing with nascar right i believe it was a bunch of uh (laughs) bunch of guys in organized crime who were running alcohol and they basically juiced up their cars and they would race them to see which one of them were faster oh wow and then they bought the danbury trash and then they bought the danbury trashers and they give it to their son that's, that's how it all kind of started right so with formula one it was seen as like Euro, right? It seemed as like, ah, it's just it's too highfalutin for us. And in, in Austin, Texas, 450,000 people showed up. I was trying to go to the Miami race uh, next June. And we were, so they, they released tickets in cohorts. And Natalie, my girlfriend, had the second cohort. She was registered for the second cohort. And they said, hey, in 24 hours, your tickets will be available. Make sure you're on your phone to buy them. And in 24 hours, she got an email saying, sorry, they're all gone. Wow. The first whole cohort bought every single seat possible. You can't buy them unless you buy them on the secondary market. So what Chase Carey's done is is amazing, and I wish I knew a little bit more about it. But just to give you an idea, that F1 series is one of the most popular on Netflix. And you think about how big shows have to be on Netflix to be in that category. It's revolutionized the sport. It's what should have happened with All or Nothing, but the Leafs sort of got in the way. I'm not going to lie. We know that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the NHL needs to do more of that. They need to, you, you cannot be gatekeepy about sports anymore. You got to let people in because we don't have that separation that we used to have with our celebrities and our sports heroes does not exist anymore. No. Elliot did report that there's a dozen or so teams that are interested, yeah. including the Montreal Canadiens. Well, I, I, yes. I thought All or Nothing was, was very, very well done. But hearing what was redacted from it by the Toronto Maple Leafs through the vine, and that's not from Amazon. Oh, I've heard some. I heard some stuff. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare. I, I wouldn't dare either. <laughs> um, I will. Uh, it's another, coming back, which is cool. Is all or nothing Leafs? No, not no. Leafs. Another yeah. team. Because yeah. it should have been Leafs, though. They El- do this with Juventus. Elliot had a yeah. had a great point on the Thirty Two Thought Show. A team like the Devils should be clamoring for mm-hmm. it because you're the Devils. Like, how far down the rung are you in like New Yorkish sports? Right, so you should be dying, dying to throw Jack Hughes in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. You got to sell yourself, right? 
And that's the, the pillar of your future. And that was Formula One. They wanted to, they like, we need to win in North America. You know, Canada has their one little race and that's fine. And we had, there was always one in Texas, but this, this year blew everything out of proportion. And they're more, they're adding more and more races as the years go on. So it's pretty cool. Go ahead, Jess. Sorry. No, oh, that was it. Okay. Um, then this was the last this point because we mentioned it before the air, before it was, uh, before we were on the air, before we were recording, that Andrew Berkshire has a great mustache. Oh, and uh, uh, what a juicy mustache that Chomes, thing is. Chomes on our Discord said, is Berkshire the real MVP of the SDPN this season? And yes. Yes, Berkshire is because the Montreal Canadiens are terrible and after every single game, he must go on and talk about it. Mm-hmm. And... For Movember, he is growing a glorious mustache. He he hasn't said "fuck it, I quit." Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, it's oh, amazing. It's uh, it's definitely a mustache that says, "Well, hello, buddy." <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I love him. <laughs> I love old time hockey on TikTok. <laughs> you don't doesn't it just make you feel like you're hanging out with a friend. I think Berkshire's mustache is fantastic. It's amazing. I, it's it maybe says less. Oh, hello, buddy, and maybe more. Wah. It's it's just very uh, wah. wah French Canadian. It's oui. very Ugh. Quebec. Yeah, yeah. It, in, in in Quebec, it's not we. Oui, it's wah wah. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> wah. It's oh man, we're taught French entirely wrong. Oh no, we're taught Ontario. France French. We're not taught Quebec French. Yeah, <laughs> they look at you like what are you what are you saying? Anyway, yeah, we'll wrap it up. Um, Check out Game Over youtube.com slash sdpn. That's right, and uh, we love you, and we will see you Wednesday when Frank Corrado. Formerly of your Toronto Maple Leafs. We'll be going. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake.